from uh, MuleSoft and uh, Salesforce, uh, respectively. We're going to be talking today about, um, you know, COVID-19, which is like obviously a hot topic, but this is an API case study. So uh, welcome to the stage. Matt, how's it going? Not bad. How are you doing, Alan? Yeah, not bad. It's been a long day, but, you know, hang in there. Well, the sun hasn't even come up here, so it's all good. Uh, I'm in Vancouver, Canada. Okay. And, uh, I don't know if it's going to come up today. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> hey, Sanja. How are you? Hello, Matt. Hi, Alan. Hi, hi. How are you? Good. The sun has risen for me in San Francisco, so it's yeah, doing good. great. Very nice. Very nice. Hey, who's sharing the screen? Oh, I got it. All right. Let's put that on. Right. Okay. Can you see it okay? Yeah, just hide the, uh, the bar at the bottom there. Oh, yeah. Hide. Yeah, that's, right. that's it. You're, you're good that to go. I'll leave you to it. Okay. Have awesome. Fun. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Alan. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, thanks to Sanjana, who you're going to hear a lot from. My name is Matt McClarty. I'm the uh, Global API Strategy Leader for MuleSoft. Uh, and and I, we're here to tell, I would say, a pretty timely story about um, an initiative that Salesforce and MuleSoft and Tableau put together in response to the pandemic in what is now, what, nine months ago? Feels like nine years ago, maybe. But, I mean, obviously, there's a lot going on. A lot of work still to be done. Uh, so this, the, but but I think, you know, it, it's very timely and very topical. I think from an API community perspective, which I know it's hard to see past because we're also personally affected by what's going on with the pandemic. I think we're also telling a story that's an important pattern that we're going to be observing a lot in the API community, which is really this intersection of data strategy and all the capabilities that have been built up around. Um, data analytics and AI and machine learning uh, and just the masses of data that we're dealing with and the possibility op offered by APIs. So I'm just going to kind of frame it that way and then and then hand it over to Sanjana. Right. So, you know, what's, what's going on out there? Uh, clearly, I think everyone has seen stats around data, the explosion of data, how, you know, every year we produce more data than ever was even accumulated in the entire human history before it. So, you know, that might be a slight exaggeration, but it's not too far off the truth. We have so much data out there that I think we've, we've moved from a, a, the problem of accumulating data and collecting data to really trying to figure out where is the needle in the haystack? Where are the insights that we can gather from the data? Um, almost this idea of data liquidity. And so as we you know, look at this from an API perspective, we know that we've got um, a great opportunity with APIs as the way of getting to that data. Uh, and I think, um, you know, so far, historically, we've seen this analytics world grow up where we have very much move all the data into some into one place. It was a data warehouse 10 years ago. It's a data lake today. And then figure out how to work with it, analyze it, access it. I think now we're getting to a point where you know, that's not practical. We have technological capabilities that allow us to access data more in real time. Can we federate the data? Can we distribute the data? Can we access you know, micro services of data that uh, will allow us to, to you know, get better access, embed them into core capabilities, business processes, and especially into user experiences? And this is where I think this intersection is so interesting. We, we now have the opportunity to access data in real time. APIs give us a way of capturing the data, um, integrating it into these business processes, uh, core capabilities, user experiences, and then a way of delivering data out into all the digital channels that we're opening up there. So I won't spend a ton of time there. I included a link to a blog that really studies this in more detail. But I think this is the challenge that we have as we're in the API world, you know, have been having lived in this world of just exposing core application functionality. We need to think more about how APIs can be used as the, the mechanism to integrate all this value that comes from data into all the different things that organizations do. And I think it's helpful to think about 
the context of data. So Peter Morville, I'm showing a honeycomb, UX honeycomb. You know, before he did the UX honeycomb in the book Information Architecture, he talked about content and users and context, right? So the more that we contextualize data, the more that we understand the context of data, that's going to help us make it more valuable, more useful. And that's something that that APIs can help provide that context and help help introduce data into all the different contexts that are out there. And so when you're thinking about your data initiatives and how APIs can play, I think it's helpful to consider two, two of these hexagons here from the honeycomb, right? One would be, how is the data useful? Who needs to use it? Who are the right consumers? What problems are they trying to solve? And then how to make the data usable? Because the more that you can make the data accessible and uh, consumable, the more you're going to have it used and the more value you're going to drive. So that's just a little bit of framing around. I think in general, what's happening for organizations who are confronting their data strategy and their API strategy, seeing how things come together. Now I'd like to hand it over to uh, Sanjana to, to walk through our example in the COVID uh, data platform. Thanks so much, Matt. And while we switch over between screens and slide sharing, I just wanted to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever in the world you're joining. I think between Netflix's new show, Emily in Paris, and now API Days in Paris, I have an itch to get to Paris in real life and hopefully in much more COVID safe times. Um, Bruce, as Matt mentioned, technology and healthcare and COVID couldn't have come at a more interesting time than it is right now. We have been able to learn so much by wanting to just unify ourselves around a simple vision. There were a team of us at Salesforce who were, you know, for lack of a better word, we just called ourselves technology aware good Samaritans. And we just wanted to be able to unify all of the different COVID-19 data sets that we were seeing everywhere and make sense of it. In doing so, we realized that we could actually be providing trusted COVID-19 data, not just to ourselves, but also to the broader community and help inform civic leaders, business administrators, and regular citizens of the world how the data actually meant the spread of COVID was happening in your locale. So this was actually the problem that we were say, seeing. There were data sources that actually had the same information, the same number, but said ever so slightly differently. There was a different tag or a different attribute name. For example, the New York Times was saying the number of infected people. However, the European CDC was calling it the number of hospitalized, which was different than perhaps another data source that just called those people sick. We knew ultimately because the number was the same and by sitting down with other medical experts that all three of these attributes were actually the same thing. So that's when we decided to map all of them and normalize the data set. So that way, whether it was deaths, death increase, count, we could always understand that these were the same numbers. So we devised a standardized data model that could actually map each data set to a unique set of attributes. And all of this information was living in Google Sheets, essentially. And that wasn't really scalable for all of us. So we wanted to actually model and then automate it and expose it in a way that was both human readable, technolog technologically available, and that too highly reliable. And the best way we, do, we did that was with APIs. Once we had all of that reliability and uptime, we actually wanted to make sense of it in a much more human readable manner. Since we were dealing with the numbers, the best way we could do it was visualize it. And that's where we used Tableau. So we could visualize all of the data that was living ultimately in a data warehouse behind this canonical data model. This became the COVID-19 data platform literally in a matter of seven weeks. We wanted to take all of that tremendous amount of data that was in circulation around COVID-19, capture the key metrics like new cases, survival rates, resource utilization, and make sure it was easily accessible in a manner that was trustworthy and secure. And it was just so paramount when we started doing this in March. So when we came together, we ultimately built a very tightly regulated data pipeline, warehouse, and set of APIs to actually help other organizations, citizens, uh, and technologists make critical decisions to help curb the spread of the virus and determine how to best move forward. So 
We did this completely openly. There's no charge to access the platform or its data. So in fact, you could Google it right away and look up and you'll see it pop up from Tableau or even the MuleSoft APIs. But we're able to work across highly curated data sources. That way, you know, you are getting accurate and trusted information, including the New York Times, the EU CDC, the Kaiser Family Foundation, and many others. After that, we put it all into a standardized data model that was protected, cleaned, and normalized. Then it was ultimately all within our resilient data pipeline. So it was reliable and scalable, built on top of mule-based APIs and accessible to everybody. So I'm gonna actually help take us through how the platform works. So the first part is the platform works by identifying and validating key data sets. We solicited important and relevant data sources right into the global uh, COVID-19 data warehouse. So when we first started, we knew that there were three data sets that were really important. The EU CDC, the COVID tracking project, and the New York Times. And this data was also validated by domain experts and curated to ensure that they were accurate and reliable. Next, we ingested and normalized it. So the data was fed through a secure series of APIs with reusable processes. This included an ingestion API, an egress API as its core connecting pieces of infrastructure. This way we could also then work with partners who could contribute data and allow anyone to consume the data openly via the APIs. In that same process, the data sets were mapped and normalized and then ultimately stored into a data warehouse that had the model at its core. And then we consumed and distributed it. No matter who you were, whether you were an internal product team at Salesforce, you were a partner in the technology ecosystem, or a stakeholder like government agencies or nonprofits or the general public, you could go to places like work.com or a the crisis response developer portal or the data hub by Tableau and actually get the specific data that you needed and get started with it in multiple different ways to really figure out how you could help your business, help make sense of the COVID pandemic around you and much more. So let's actually go in another level deep and let's see how the data gets curated in. First of all, there's so much data out there. You have public health data that's telling you things like the case, like infections and death. You have testing data, how much, how many testing kits are actually in circulation, what's the status of them, observations and symptoms of COVID, which especially in March, April, May, we didn't really know who had COVID and what the signs were. There were also predictive models, such as if you have this much COVID cases in your area today, what it is what is it going to look like three months from now? transmission rates, excessive deaths. We needed to capture all of this public health data because it was the one being asked the most questions of. Then there was other public data, such as non-pharmaceutical intervention data. That's a fancy way of saying government policies that are actually in effect to help curb the spread of the virus. It could be whether or not there's a mask wearing policy in effect, or perhaps a travel ban in effect, schools being closed, et cetera. We combine this with mobility data, measuring public transportation status, socioeconomic data, and other social determinants to really have a better contextual understanding on the landscape with the community. And lastly, there was medical resource data, like how much PPE was available, ventilators, beds, personnel equipment, lab capacity. And this was actually really hard information to get to because it's just so tightly regulated in the healthcare industry. Once we knew what each of the data was, though, we were able to bucket it appropriately and normalize it. And then we actually had to look at what kind of APIs and protocols and architectures we needed to best expose it. We ultimately looked, uh, chose a REST API because we wanted to have the option of using different specification types, exposing the data model more appropriately. And we also knew we were being driven with simple functions, but complex data. That was pretty much the hallmark reason as to why REST was our best decision. And knowing that we wanted this to all be web accessible rather than a web service, we knocked out gRPC really quickly. The next thing we started looking at pretty much three months after we started was an OData API for ourselves internally. That way we could connect to core systems within our own enterprises. 
The other part is that we had this huge data model that underpins our entire interaction model. And OData, as indicated in its name, uses those defined data models to be published, uh, published and edited by web clients. So as a result, it was something we knew we should be building after we could prove out our first few iterations of this pipeline. And in the future, we'd love to be looking at something like GraphQL, but we simply did not have the time in the beginning to consider that here. Next was actually how the data was flowing in. Our data from these different sources was coming in two predominant forms, CSV or JSON. But we did notice that there was incredible amounts of PDF documents with those same data. We needed to make sure that it was really quickly scalable and easy to get to. And so all the data that we chose could then be consumed via our Ingress API in JSON or CSV format. And we decided to normalize it all through with JSON. We also know that from previous experiences that XML processing is really heavy, the payload sizes would have been much larger than JSON or CSV payload sizes. And since we were not building a SOAP service, we weren't gonna be using XML. The next part was, however, processing all of that data and information. And when it came in, it came in as a mule message because that's the APIs that we built. And lastly, we pushed data out, normalized in JSON format. So that takes us into here. How did we actually build the series of scalable or APIs in this pipeline using mule? Well, we had three rules, first of all. One, cloud-first availability at all times. Two, maximizing open consumptions. And three, making this API actually human readable and human usable. So we started off here by taking a three-tiered architecture approach, which is pretty common for us at MuleSoft. But we first started at a system layer where we took all of the places that we were actually getting data from. It could have been the individual website of that data source provider. It could have been GitHub. It could have been a PDF document, but we had to ensure that we could connect to them first. Then we had to connect to our data warehouse, which in this case was all on Snowflake. Then we actually had to create the pipeline so that the data we got in would also go to the place where the data had to go out to. And we did that with a series of queuing mechanisms. So that way we wouldn't be pushing data 24 seven, but we could actually batch it and send it off all at once. So we used a series of queues as well to help stagger the time at which all the data was being pushed. Then we also created a secondary API at the experience layer that we could use to actually trigger this entire workflow to run on our own. And that way we could also push it outwards whenever we needed to right away, both to the API and to the visualizations. So when we looked at the high level design, we wanted to take an API-led approach to building these APIs. And we were using this architecture approach to actually get to scale much more quickly. We started off here by designing our system APIs to every specific data source. And upon reaching, I believe, our third system API specification, we actually started templatizing those specs. Those templates included standard HTTP responses, error messages and authentication behavior that we were reusing across every system we were connecting to or every data source. We defined the error structure really easily as well because we built a custom error handling module. And we wanted to make sure that this could just be quickly scaled out no matter how many data sources ultimately we found that could be reliable and trustworthy. And we did not want the tech to be the bottleneck to getting to that data. So we had all of these reusable fragments. In about three and a half weeks of starting this project, we ended up with 15 API specifications built out all on RAML, two API fragments with the core reusable libraries, primarily around error handling, and one master library with all of the rules to respect our canonical data model. Next, we got into implementing our pipeline we had another about three and a half, four weeks to actually go through implementation, where two thirds of our time were spent on nailing the data transformations. And then the other third of our time was pretty much spent on validating the flow of information across. Now, this was pretty key. Remember, data was coming in in multiple different formats, but we needed to ensure that the data going outward all looked the same in JSON format. And 
it could be pretty understandable what our tag or attribute was or the key to the actual value that was being uh, displayed. Now, going through this, the implementation templates were finalized before the development. So we spent all of our time ensuring and testing our transformation logic. That makes a lot of sense as well, because we wanted to make sure that everything could be readable at the end of the day. And I can't stress this more. If it wasn't readable while we were developing it, it definitely couldn't be readable for anybody else who actually called on the API or looked at a visualization. We also got a few benefits out of the box for us. We used DataWeave, which is a data transformation language, and we also used a plethora of metadata resolution as well to ensure that we could get all the information that we needed. In fact, DataWeave was so helpful that we were able to reuse all of the transformation functions that we were using. Sometimes we were even transforming some basic SQL queries as well, just to make sure the data was correct. So at the end, we wrote close to 40 different DataWeave helper functions that could execute our processes. We also tested whether or not connections were being made to the source systems and that the application logic blocks were correct. Was it actually pushing information? Was anything being rejected? And once that cleared, we actually had a way to define what, are, what were our standards for user acceptance testing. So this meant that the data was being ingested from raw sources in the correct format. And lastly, was actually showing the information. We went live twice uh, because deploying our APIs did not mean going live with the platform alone. We wanted to make sure the entire user experience was clear. We did roll it back twice because we realized APIs itself didn't mean that the entire platform experience was being delivered. We deployed our APIs and our visualizations together so that way we could see the information as well as read it in text format. And this was huge. Now we had the power of graphics with the power of text and code all in one. So when we look back at what we were able to build, we wanted to ensure that everything could be shared. There were behavioral changes because we published a live API implementation and we needed to engage with our community better. And also at the same time, make sure that people could actually make sense of all of this. It was really, really important data. When we first went out, we saw that we were not as open as we wanted. There was this button that said, request access to an open API. We changed that pretty quickly when we rolled back and then had the live API endpoint actually published on the site. So that way you could get started right away. And just some of the results that we saw within, I believe, four weeks of going live. We survived a minor DDoS attack and we had a CDN or, uh, that actually protected us even more from it. We were averaging about 600,000 unique API requests and 30,000 views on our visualizations and our tables. But today, almost nine months later, that's grown to 2.7 million API calls against this API. So when we look at some of this in action, we can see an incredible amount of resources. We can also see a lot of people around the world uh, actually using and calling on our API. And we grew it from this pipeline to adding about eight more data sources within a fraction of weeks. We went from having this simple three-tiered architecture approach and revised it seven times four weeks after that to scale ourselves out. And we didn't have to change a lot of our core processes to do it, which was fantastic. So some of our lessons learned at the end of the day was contextualized data is in high demand. We were comparing data sets manually before. Now we didn't have to do it. And the data needed to be consistent and available. So when the data is available in different formats or different ecosystems, you wanna make sure that it's available in all of those places at once. Again, automation being the core unifying framework behind it. And readability couldn't be more prioritized. So when we have all of these different data sources, data providers, there became a huge appetite to work together. And we wanted to continue to do that. So net net, there's a huge opportunity to collaborate together, to move across different ecosystems, using APIs as the forefront pipeline to move data between each other, contextualize it and expose. 
So I'm gonna hand it back over to Matt, but thanks so much for hearing a little bit more about how we built this. Yeah, thanks very much, Sanja. And we've got some links here. I know we're, we're right about at time. So uh, I wanna thank everyone. And I don't know if there are any last minute questions, Alan. Well, I, I'm gonna squeeze a quick question. And I mean, it, it feels like there were 500 people involved in getting that much work done. Uh, actually, you know, how, how big was the team you had? And, and uh, well, give us a flavor of the roles that were involved. Yeah, we had a team of about 26 people ultimately that were jumping in and out. This was a completely volunteer effort. So people were, you know, dedicating an hour or two every now and then. Our core team was built of six people uh, who have stayed across the project to date. So one, we had an API product manager, that was myself. We okay. had a Tableau visualization product manager. We had somebody who was responsible for the core data model. And then we had two dedicated developers for the last nine months and somebody dedicated to testing the entire thing. And that was our team, that was our breakup. Wow, very, very impressive. Very impressive, guys. Great, well, I'd uh, like to thank you for that. I uh, enjoyed that a lot. It's uh, uh, you have a nice penultimate uh, act before the, the final one of today. So thank you very much.